Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Why Are Military Personnel and Veterans Supporting Donald Trump? Uh, this topic is not um, pleasurable for me to have to discuss. This is a topic that involves our former Commander-in-Chief, President of the United States, and our would-be uh, uh, candidate for President of the United States, the 47th President of the United States. And the topic is his obvious disrespect for veterans and current military personnel. Uh, not just recently, but through the tenure of his, his being the President of the United States and as a candidate. And here to discuss this topic with me is my esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you know, Jay, I, I really don't like to discuss this topic because it, it puts a knot in my stomach. It makes me feel disgusted when I have to talk about all the things that Donald Trump has said and done uh, about our military personnel, about our, our veterans, living or dead. And um, I just don't like it. But uh, we have to discuss it because uh, there is a great voting population of this country, that are our military personnel. And uh, I'm, I'm flummoxed. I'm confused as to why our military is supporting Donald Trump despite all these things he's said and done since 2016, that is such a disgrace that it's hard for me even to describe, but we're gonna describe it here today. So let's get the ball rolling. Uh, let's just start with the most recent, that we have two uh, Trump campaign personnel getting into a verbal and physical altercation at the Arlington Cemetery, the National Cemetery in Section 60, because they wanted to record or photograph Donald Trump in the cemetery and show how Donald Trump loves veterans. And they obviously wanted to use that as a campaign ad, uh, insert those images in a campaign ad, which is against federal law. And the federal law is you are not to use any images of the cemetery for campaign purposes. Yet here we have Donald Trump, doesn't care, doesn't care what the law is and certainly doesn't care about the respect or the lack thereof towards the fallen soldiers that gave their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. Your thoughts about the most recent story? It was an outrage. It was an absolute outrage. It was an outrage even if he hadn't demonstrated disrespect for the military and the fallen soldiers of our country many, many times before. Standing well by itself, it was an outrage. And P.S., you know, one of the one of the things that followed that uh, altercation at Arlington was that, in fact, although it's against the law, one of his acolytes was, in fact, taking pictures. And those pictures appeared on the Web. So they did it, even though they knew before, during and after it was against the law and it was completely tasteless. But you say you say it disgusts you. I, I, I wouldn't limit the the uh, phenomenon of disgust just to this. Uh, so much of what he has done, what he does every day, uh, since 2016 in any event, is disgusting. And it is very difficult for me to understand why anybody would follow him. But I, but I have a theory. I have a theory. They are, mm, they are, they are available to him on the basis of bigotry on the basis of racism. You know, it's the old theory is that if you appeal to somebody on one issue, especially a cult figure, um, then, uh, then you are likely to follow that cult figure on other issues. So you have to look for the issue that drew them in in the first place. Um, and I don't necessarily think it was disdain for the military. It was racism. It was bigotry. Uh, in, in raw form, and they follow him around and they accept what he has to say about so many other issues, including this one. But this one is particularly offensive because I think that, uh, you know, he and his father lived in a household which was not patriotic, but anti-patriotic. They couldn't care about the military. They couldn't care about national service at all. They couldn't care about the country. They were anti-patriots. Remember, you know, his father was active with the Ku Klux Klan and arrested at one point for being involved in a Ku Klux Klan rally. 
that's what really, you know, that, that's the driver here for, for Trump. This is only another subsidiary issue, but it's terrible. It's awful. And it's very hard to understand why anybody, either military, a family of military, or anyone who knows anybody in the military, or anybody who, who you know, pretends to be patriotic, could ever respect what he says and what he does. There are so many examples of this anti-patriotism, this disdain for our fallen heroes. As you said, disgusting. Well, I, I'm gonna go down um, this horrid list of memory lane here. I distinctly remember uh, doing a show with you and Cynthia Sinclair in October, 2020, just after the Jeffrey Goldberg article in The Atlantic came out. Jeffrey Goldberg was the editor in chief and he had four anonymous sources, not just one, but he had four anonymous sources that said that uh, Donald Trump refused to go to the cemeteries in France on the 100th centennial anniversary of the end of World War I. He refused to go to the cemetery because uh, he said, why would I want to go there? There's nothing but losers. This is a direct quote to an anonymous source at that time. That source now has come out uh, came out about a year and a half ago, uh, three-star general, General John Kelly, who also was his chief of staff. So he had a reason to be there. Uh, he also said on the same day about going or not going to the cemetery near Paris um, for those 1,800 U.S. Marines that were killed in action uh, in the Bella Wood uh, campaign. And he refused to go there because he called, and, and his 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 description of those fallen soldiers were they were suckers. In section 60 of the Arlington National Cemetery, the same section where they were taking photos uh, as of Monday for campaign purposes, that same section, he said to John Kelly, as he's looking at the grave sites in section 60, I don't get it. I don't see what they got out of it. Uh, these are just a couple, we're gonna go over a few more, but. Uh, the point is, and, and maybe you're right, Jay, maybe it is a fact that it's their racism or their deep-seated love for what Donald Trump says and represents that gets past their patriotism. But I guarantee you, every Memorial Day weekend, every um, Veterans Day, the first ones out putting flags on their porch are American flags, are veterans and current military personnel. One point, Tim, is that every time you see Trump making a statement, making an appearance, having a rally or a uh, press press conference, you see him surrounded with American flags. I wrote a piece about that a year or two ago, and I pointed out that that was a hijack. He, he doesn't believe in America. He doesn't believe in patriotism. He doesn't believe in, in preserving our democracy. And yet he uses these symbols or misuses them, as is the case, um, to sort of connect on an emotional level with people who are impressed with the flag. Uh, and I, I just find it completely obnoxious that on the one hand, he's running the country down, running the military down, uh, an anti-patriot, if you will. And on the other hand, he's surrounded, wrapped in American flags. Go figure. Well, I don't think we'll ever forget him um, groping, I use the term groping, the American flag on stage. And um, I needed to take a shower after I saw that image. Uh, Chuck, let's go to you. Do you agree with Jay on his, his theory about why veterans support Trump, despite all these horrible images, things he says, things he does? Um, or is there something else? I mean, you and Jay are both veterans, so... What is it in the psychological makeup for someone, a veteran who loves their service that they put in, uh, is proud of their service, is proud of serving in the military, is very patriotic, I think most of them are. Uh, what psychological hurdle do they have to leap in order to support someone who clearly shows disrespect and disdain for our armed services? Well, first I need to make a correction. I'm not a veteran. I actually, <laughs> served my alternative service as a conscientious objector in Vietnam for three years during the war, 1968 to 1971. Probably the only one I know that's <laughs> that. Some people think it's a little crazy, but 
if you want to find out what's really going on, you go where it's happening. I think Jay has only begun to scratch the surface of so many weaknesses and biases and really divisive, destructive elements in people. You have to remember two things. One, combat veterans in many, many, many cases are severely emotionally scarred. Most of them did not get received well, did not get treated well, did not get resources to help them get through that, get past it, get control of it, be able to manage it effectively in their lives. Okay. So you've got a susceptible population. There. The other things Jay's hit upon is together with the susceptibility, there are a great number of people who go into the military service. And if you look at it, if they were going to geographically dis distribute it, I bet you the South and the Southeast would have a substantial majority. That's what I saw. And that was 40 something years ago, 50 something years ago in Vietnam. But the number of young, uneducated Southern, mostly white, but also many, many black soldiers. And you got to distinguish there because if you're looking for buy-in to the Trump MAGA stuff, which is pretty unpalatable, um, you need people who have kind of grown up on pretty unpalatable food. So that, that's where you're going to find them, right? So, are, so you, if I were to just... Are you just saying these veterans are desensitized, that they've, they've consumed enough of Donald Trump's uh, pablum, that um, something as horrific as disrespecting veterans is just part of the menu? I wouldn't go that far. I mean, because it is personal to them. But you also have to remember that because Trump's a show-me-the-money guy, and his political talent is right up there with Tom Cruise's acting talent. So it's not, not real high on the Oscar list. But because defense contractors are huge donors, particularly to the Republican Party, Trump's support for defense funding was pretty much carte blanche rubber stamp. So whether they're looking at how they were compensated or benefited during Trump's presidency, whether they're looking at whether he's insulting people that their personal and cultural biases may incline them to disfavor, he's tapping right into unfortunately, the worst of veterans. And I don't think that's going to last because now, kind of like Kamala and Trump, right? We've got somebody young, intelligent, strong, articulate, and then we got the other guy. <clears throat> We've got somebody who did serve verifiably. How many years of military service for Tim Walz, right? <clears throat> 24. And to just put this to rest at the beginning, he earned the sergeant major rank, but because the military processing was delayed at the time that he mustered out, it had not been completed yet. So he was still technically a master sergeant. Okay, big fat deal. The guy had earned the rank with years of service. The other thing is, look at how he responds. J.D. Vance makes up all kinds of stinky false stuff about Waltz and anybody else he's opposing, to which Tim Waltz's response is, I have one phrase for J.D. Vance. Thank you for your service. Hey, that's it. Mm -hmm. You have class, you have dignity, you have a guy who respects the service. So I don't think it matters that 
there are polls showing that there are substantial numbers of people in the military or former military who support Trump. I don't think that has very much to do with their veteran status or their military status. I think it has to do with the other factors that Jay's identified, their personal factors. And hey, if you want the worst of people, you know, vote for the orange guy. But if you really want the best of people and people who are going to ask for it, people who are going to model it, people who are going to offer it themselves and live it, make the other choice. Well, we're not talking just about veterans here. The term veteran means somebody who has served and is no longer serving. Uh, whether that person has retired or just uh, come to the end of his or her enlistment. Um, so we're really talking about hmm, active duty as well and reserves and veterans. Um, number two, I want to mention that um, I, I, I think the, the, the composition, Chuck alluded to this, the composition of the American military has changed dramatically to the romantic composition we saw happening in World War II, where they came from all over the country. They were draftees. It was an existential threat and um, everyone participated right down to Rosie the Riveter. And the country was committed to this patriotism and the military was committed. And all those war movies where these guys from Brooklyn would get along with the guys from Oklahoma, um, you know, that was real and that brought the country together. It was a positive thing to see them all working for patriotic goals. It's not like that anymore. And I think Chuck is right about the map. Um, these are all volunteers. And they come from areas where maybe they don't have options. They come from areas which have, they start out with the political bent one way or the other, usually on the conservative side. <clears throat> okay, one more point I want to mention is that when they get into the service, especially enlisted, but maybe officer too, the idea is to strip out the old and, you know, and build in the new. And the new is following orders. Don't think about it. Just do what you have to do, do what we tell you to do. And so, you know, that's the way the military works these days. These guys who, on the World War II movies, who make jokes about officers and the like, um, they're not so many of them. Um, they just follow orders. And I got a short story for you. I know a fellow just got out of the Navy, and uh, this was at a time when Trump uh, commanded, as as the commander in chief, that the name of the ship, the John S. McCain, be covered with a tarp when it was in um, the base in Yakuska. And the only reason was that he was he was running McCain down. Remember, uh, he said uh, McCain was not a war hero because uh, he was taken prisoner and he served as a P POW. And that, and that was worthy of Trump's disdain. So he, um, he, he caused uh, the, ca the captain of that ship to put a tarp over it. So I asked a young fellow who just got out of the Navy, I, I asked him, you know, if you had been given the order to put a tarp over your ship's name, the name of a war hero, a war hero, would you have done that or would you have questioned that order? And uh, I'm not saying I agreed or that I admired him for his answer, but his answer was, oh, certainly I would have done it because it was a lawful order and orders are lawful um, presumptively. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you have is a, is a military who would follow the orders, follow the orders of their commanders and follow the orders of the commander in chief. And that's one of the things that affects today's American military. The commander in chief is king. He's dictator king, as far as the military is concerned. The other, the other story I want to tell you before I stop is uh, I was a lieutenant commander in the late 60s, uh, legal lieutenant commander in the Coast Guard. And I was walking through what National Station in Washington, the railway station there, and crowded. It was during the war. And I heard a voice from behind me. Uh, and, and there was no military around, just me in uniform. 
And I heard a voice from behind me, and I turned and saw, to my shock, my horror, uh, a, an army private who had been shot up, and his face had been essentially destroyed. And he was walking right behind me, and he was saying, Commander, uh, can you help me? And I said to myself, I'm very touched by that. I'm touched that he would address me. I'm touched that he would ask me for my help. But he could have asked any number of people. He asked me because I was the only guy in that area in the station that he could see who was military. And I'm saying, gee whiz, you know, does the country care about these guys whose faces have been shot off? Um, the notion of patriotism in general has changed, especially with an all-volunteer force. So I think Trump is playing to that, aside from the fact that he's, he's trying to connect on a, on a, big, a bigotry or racism basis, you know, as, as the primary connection. That's, that's my view of it. He's also trying to connect to a country that has long forgotten the notion of caring about its um, active duty militaries, its wounded, its killed, its veterans. Um, and he's talking to a country that is no longer patriotic. He's applying his non-patriotism and seeing if they follow. And guess what? They do, because the commander in chief is king, because the people in that station didn't really care much. And so we have really lost connection with those who would put their lives on the line for the country. All right, well, I'm gonna exchange a, <clears throat> a story and then I'll follow up with a question, Jay. And that is, um, Mark. this comes from Mark Milley, General Mark Milley. And that um, they were at, uh, Mark Milley was the Joint Chief of Staff and this was a, a, a gathering, a celebration of his um, being appointed the Joint Chief of Staff. And there was a certain army captain by the name of Louis Avila. And what did Louis Avila do? He sang God Bless America. Now, Louis Avila, Captain Louis Avila, was in a wheelchair and was an amputee. Uh, Donald Trump didn't like that. And he turned to uh, General Mark Milley and said, and I quote, why do you bring people like that here? No one wants to see that, the wounded. So not only is this a disrespect, for someone who sacrificed their legs in a, a conflict, a combat conflict, but he also has disdain for anyone who's disabled. And we've seen that on the campaign trail back in 2016. I guess my question is this, is it fair or right for the Democrats to bring up these examples of Donald Trump and his horrific, horrible statements he makes about veterans and active personnel. Uh, um, Panetta, former chief of staff at the Democratic National Convention, cited the example of him saying that the dead in France were losers and suckers. Uh, is, is it warranted for the Democrats to bring up these comments during the 2024 campaign? Uh, it's absolutely warranted. It, it is a, a defining aspect of Trump. And if you, if you connect the dots on this and put all those stories together and all those statements together, what you get is a, a traitor, a traitor to the country. And it's easy to understand January 6th. He doesn't care about the country. He doesn't care about democracy. He doesn't care about the soldiers and sailors uh, that put their lives on the line. I, I, find, it, I find it more worthy of criticism for those who don't call him out on this. They should be calling him out. The question, the question is whether the things he has said and done affect his electability. And I think as far as the military is concerned, maybe not. You know, he sees they see him as commander in chief and he must be right. Um, but on the other hand, uh, when they think about their own lives and their own patriotism, and I think a lot of them are very patriotic. The people I knew in the service were were completely patriotic every day, all day. So I don't know how they deal with that conflict, but I'm right. not sure that they would, I'm not sure that they would hold it against him. And I'm not sure the country in general, the non-veterans, the non-active duty, um, you know, the ones who, who, who may agree that they're suckers and losers, 
who don't care about the military. Um, may, maybe they don't really care about any of this and it doesn't matter to them in, when they evaluate uh, who they're going to vote for. But they should. Okay, Chuck, hey, um, uh, Jay mentioned that perhaps Donald Trump is trying to redefine patriotism or bury patriotism as uh, a, a criteria of being a good American. Uh, well, Jay didn't say that. I said that. Uh, do you think Donald Trump is trying to redefine what patriotism looks like? <laughs> well, uh, there's so many. There's so many avenues you could go. Yeah. So many potential sarcastic answers to that, right? I mean, it's to the same extent that he's trying to define what male fitness looks like. I will say that. Okay. <laughs> that was pretty good. But Jay's point is a really important one because uh, Trump plays to flocks of what he believes are his followers who are hierarchically obedient, deferential, that military. So where else do you find that? In religions. He's got evangelical pastors out there doing exactly what Jay's talking about military officers doing, basically lecturing their flocks, their troops, to say, go vote for Trump, go vote MAGA. These are people who, if you talk to true Christians, eh, their conduct, their words have absolutely nothing to do with the example that Christ lived. He took in everybody. Christ spoke up for the poor, for the diseased, for the afflicted. Probably more than anybody in the history of religion, other than like Mother Teresa and some of those, right? Gandhi and others. But that's the contrast here. And so I guess what I keep coming back to, and Jay's example is a good one. Hey, do you want to live with choice and have choice in your life? Then make a choice. That's what he's trying to steer people away from. He does not want them to make or have choices. Ultimately, that's essentially the only way that he gets what he wants, is to take all the choice onto himself and take it away from everyone else. I guess um, I'll just talk about my personal experience of talking with Marines, veterans, of uh, being a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And of course, these are diehard Trump followers. Why do you say, of course, because they were Marines, this makes them diehard Trumpers? No, this particular one that um, is my neighbor, okay. who I, I, I dearly admire. Um, gee, he's a great guy. And I said, doesn't it bother you that Donald Trump referred to the dead fallen soldiers as suckers and losers? And then I brought up all the other many examples. And he said, well, that story was never true. And I said, why do you think it was not true? He said, well, because the source was never identified. So years later, John, you know, General John Kelly confirmed he was the source of the story. And I came back to my good friend here. And I said, now that the source has been revealed, uh, what's your position on it? And he said, well, he's a loser. And therefore, everything he says is a losing, uh, is a lie. Therefore, the story doesn't count. And I guess that's the kind of hypnotic effect that Donald Trump has um, influenced many of the veterans and active personnel is that um, despite these horrible things that Donald Trump says about veterans, dead veterans, uh, it doesn't seem to matter. Will this continue up until Election Day that uh, veterans that support Trump will continue to ignore their conscience and or reality. Your earlier question was really good, Tim, which is what's it gonna take uh, for people with military connections, either current or past, uh, to realize what they're really looking at here, what he really represents. One word, borrow from Descartes, think. Is that the answer, Jay, that uh, military will reevaluate kind of their position and their love for Trump? I'm, I'm afraid that uh, when you go look through the rank and file and you talk to the average soldier in active duty, he, he's usually a, a Trumper. I, I knew one and I said, well, do your, your colleagues, you know, your fellow soldiers feel the same way that you do? He says, absolutely. 
and uh, everybody in his unit was a Trumper. And the officers who commanded his unit were Trumpers. I just wonder if, if, if a Democratic campaign nominee were to say anything close to what Donald Trump has said about veterans, how that would go over um, to the nation. Because for whatever reason, Donald Trump gets a pass on this stuff. And yeah, it's a story for a day or two, then it's swept under the carpet. Uh, I can't imagine Walsh or, or Harris saying anything disparaging about a veteran that it wouldn't be in the news cycle for a month or two. Well, they should point it out, and we should point it out, and everybody should point it out. Um, you know, the problem, of course, is that the military votes in their home states, so it's not a, a voting block mm -hmm. so, per se. And they just uh, they add votes here and subtract votes there all around the country. Um, but the other thing, you know, the, it, it, we're about to close, but I, I really want to add this point. Um, Trump, during his term, he gave a lot of money to the military, and the military has a budget, whether they spend it well or not, and I, for one, do not believe they spend it well, um, they get almost a trillion dollars a year, not in total, but a trillion dollars a year uh, for hardware and all the other expenses of running a military with millions of people involved. The uh, officers, the Pentagon, and uh, to a large extent, the, the soldiers and sailors are like that. They like um, having Trump give them money. It's transactional. And it may, it may bother us to see that they might vote for Trump for no good reason. And even, even when Trump is insulting them on a regular basis, even when Trump is by no means a patriot in any, any sense of the word, the problem I have, are you ready, gentlemen? Are you sitting down? He's buying them. He's buying their obedience in case they're is a move under the Insurrection Act. And so if it comes um, you know, to that, where he wants the military um, to engage in violence against American citizens on American soil, that's where he wants them to be loyal. And I think they may very well be loyal. Yep. OK, we've run out of time. So uh, last thoughts, uh, Chuck, with you. And one of the classic examples of that was Trump usurped the church and hold up the Bible upside down. But, you know, you can't read, so it doesn't really matter. And the general that he got to accompany him when he discovered that Trump was invoking the National Guard to clear peaceful demonstrators out so he could do a public relations shoot in front of a church that he never attended, holding a Bible that he didn't even know which end was up on. <clears throat> Disavowed it. <clears throat> and I'm sure your friend would say, your neighbor would say this, the exact same thing, which is, it didn't happen. You can't believe it. Right. And there's, there's the crux of the issue. Um, and between confirmation bias and cognitive disson dissonance, there is room for all kind of mental vacuity. <clears throat> Trump exploits mental vacuity as well as moral. Thank you, Chuck. Jay, your last thought. This is really an important issue, Tim. I compliment you on organizing the show around this issue because you know the integrity of the country domestically and overseas is really a function of whether our military is well-trained, well-motivated. Well and I think what Trump has done, he has created a divisiveness, not only among the citizens of our country, not only among the nations of the world, but among the members of our military, which makes them less effective and very worrisome. Okay. Um, before we end, I'd just like to mention that I believe it's General McMasters who's coming out with his book that's released today. We'll see what surprises or, or no surprises it's just expected uh, stories of further comments from Donald Trump about the disrespect of active personnel and veterans serving our country. Let me add this, though, Tim. Um, if he gets back in the Oval Office, you won't see McMasters or Kelly there, and you won't see Milley there. You'll see another Joint Chiefs. You'll see another cadre of um, high-ranking officers who are totally, absolutely, absolutely loyal to Trump, who will do everything 
that he asks them to do, who won't complain, who won't write books, who won't um, you know, provide information to the media, and who will tell the soldiers and sailors under their command they have to follow what Trump wants. And that will be different. There won't be anybody breaking ranks under another Trump administration. Well, you, you may be right, you won't see him. Uh, if Donald Trump has his way, he's already said overtly uh, in front of the cameras that General Mattis ought to be executed. So your point is well taken. I'm Tim Apicella, and I'd like to thank my esteemed, my, my esteemed guests, Chuck Crumpton and my co-host, Jay Fidel. Tim Apicella, your host for American Issues Take One. Won't you join us next week? And until then, aloha. Mm -hmm.